But God, we just thank you for your presence among us this morning, for the wonderful time of worship, for that beautiful special, and for the truth that it contained, that you lead us by your hand, and we know that you lead us by your word. And so we come this morning, we just ask you, Lord, to lead us into all truth by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we might take this portion of Scripture today, recognize that you packed it with truth, packed it with, with life for us to impart or take from you, to make it part of our lives and to live it out. Not to be just hearers of the word, but doers. And none of that can happen without the power of your Holy Spirit. So we thank you that he would quicken us today to receive this word and the fullness that you've given it. We thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have seen over the course of several books that we've been studying, we studied Paul's letters to the Colossian church, his letter to the Ephesian church. We've started to study Paul, uh, Peter's first letter here, and we've seen oftentimes a, a transitional word that is used to connect thoughts so that we understand that it all flows together. The transitional word that they've often used is therefore, therefore. If I've already told you this, therefore you should understand this. If I've already told you this, therefore you should live this way. Now we're going to see Peter using a similar word here. He says in some versions it's translated likewise, in other versions it's translated in the same way. So we see here in uh, verse 1 of the third chapter, wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. So that word, likewise, ties that verse into everything that Peter has been saying up till now. And you might recall, if you were here last week, that Peter's been stressing that Christians, God has called us to be of a submissive heart. Who are we called to submit to? Peter says we're called to submit to the governing authorities that God has put in our lives. If we work for somebody, that boss is somebody we're supposed to submit to. Even if they're not good authorities, even if they're not nice bosses, our call before God is to put ourselves in a position of yieldedness or submission. And so, continuing that thought, Peter says, wives, likewise. Likewise, in the same way, some, some versions say, in the same way as I just talked about submitting to uh, governing authorities, as I just talked about submitting to uh, your employers, you wives in the same way. Now, I like to be submissive to scripture. I like to obey what God's word says. I can't obey this scripture. I'm unable to obey this scripture. It's not written to me. It's written to wives. And so even though I could expound on it and teach on it from a, 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 a theological perspective, I think it's better for you to hear what Peter's saying here from somebody who actually knows how to live it. And so I'm going to ask my wife to come up and bring forth this portion of scripture. Well, good morning. So I felt like what the Lord would do would have us go back to the beginning before we go to Peter. In order to receive really what he's saying with an open heart, I want us to look at what God said in the garden when he said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So God looked and saw that man in his own strength was not able to be alone. He needed a companion, a helper, a support network, right? And so we see that the word, that word helper means to help in daily living, helping producing a family, and again, to being that support, to complement who he was. And God also knew that they would need help finding things. Amen. <laughs> And we see that the woman in 
Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. So we see here that the woman had stepped out of her role as a help and basically she became a hindrance in that situation. But the man in Genesis says, the man said, when asked, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. And so again, when Adam was asked, he took the role of accusing. And that scenario is operating today in our marriages and in our relationships. But none of this took God by surprise because as Pastor Steve has been teaching, when he laid the foundations of the earth, he knew everything that would happen from beginning to end, from the end back to the beginning. That's the kind of God that we serve, a God who knows the end from the beginning. Not only in all of creation, all of the universe, but in each and every one of our lives, he knows the end from the beginning. What an awesome God we serve. And so when the serpent got his sentence in Genesis 3.15, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So we see that God, who knew everything, was going to use the seed of a woman in playing a role in undoing the effects of the fall. And we see in the New Testament where the Holy Spirit shows up in a woman, Mary, and that seed is Jesus Christ. So now, let's go back to 1 Peter 3 with that in mind, and I'm going to read the verse again. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. So we see that Peter here is addressing married women and unmarried women the same. But what is happening is that he is reminding us that we have a responsibility before God regarding our conduct. And I just want to look at that word. It actually means conversation. It means the whole manner of life. Everything about our lives. Every area of our lives and the way that we behave. And again, it means what comes out of our mouths. So then it goes on to say, when they, your unsaved spouse, any unsaved people for that matter, in our lives, they will always be watching us. Have you learned that? They are always watching everything we do. But when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, and we see the word chaste means exciting reverence, and we should be excited to be able to walk in that kind of reverence towards God. It means pure from carnality and modest. And the thing is, is that God is looking for us to have a holy fear. Where has the holy fear gone? That holy reverence to the Lord. Where has it gone? And that when we can come to that place where we have such a reverential fear of God, we will fear nothing that the world has for us to throw in our path because we'll have such a trust level and a confidence in who he is. Amen? So the verse goes on to say, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. And so we see these three areas that women love, our hair, jewelry, and our clothing, right? And so what he's saying here is that it's okay to look nice, especially if you want to look nice for yourself, for your husband, or for the Lord. But if that's all we have is an outward package, then we've missed everything. Because God only can see the heart. He only can see the heart. And when we stand before him, that's what he's going to be talking to us about. And I looked a little deeper into the quiet and gentle spirit because the thing is, is that it doesn't mean that all of a sudden you have to get quiet. 
and gentle? What if you have a somewhat of a robust personality or a bubbling personality? What he's saying here is that not to be anxious or wrought up or edgy or upset. So if you have a bubbling personality, bubble out, but not with an edginess. Amen? And so when we look at something that is precious to God, the very thing that we should desire is to do something and aim for and shoot for something that is precious in the sight of our God. And when we look at that word, it requires a very great outlay, it's very costly, it's excellent, and it's of surpassing value. And there is a sacrifice and a price to pay when we walk this walk with God. Right? So if we're seeking something that is precious to him, it's going to take a bit of a sacrifice and even a suffering on our part. So again, God's not looking at our jewelry, he's looking at our hearts. And so we go on and it says, For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. And so we have an opportunity here to learn from those mighty men and women who went before us to learn about submission and faithfulness, and it is a very honorable thing for us as wives to be in submission to our husbands. And the thing is, is that you, you can do what this verse says. You can call your husband Lord, but don't do it if your heart's not in it. Again, it goes back to the heart issue. Amen? And so the Lord, the Lord had, is having us focus on two areas today. It's faithfulness and a yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. So since Peter is using Sarah and Abraham, I believe the Lord wants to remind us that that covenant was made between the three of them. It was made between God and Sarah and Abraham, and they each had their role and their part to play to walk out in their own faithfulness to God. And really, it was a long journey for them when I read about them. And I know sometimes we feel like this is a long journey. But what a good, good journey, isn't it? Isn't God amazing? He's so faithful. And when I looked up the word, the faithfulness in the, in the word, most of the scriptures obviously pertain to his faithfulness, not ours. Amen? Faithfulness is a fruit of the Spirit, but we need to learn faithfulness from the most one who is the most faithful. And Psalm 36, 5 says, Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. His faithfulness is never-ending. And everything he said he would do in the word of God, he's done. And he will continue to fulfill his word and his promises because he's faithful. And Psalm 37, 3 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Feed on who he is. Feed on his supremacy and his awesomeness. The fact that he is the owner of the whole universe and he's got everything covered. Feed on that faithfulness of God. So in turn, I want to ask you what our faithfulness would look like. And this is what the word means. It's a conviction of the truth of God's word. And I don't know about you, but there's a lot of untruth out there lately, isn't there? And we're the ones that have the word of God within us, and we need to speak the truth to the world, to our unsaved husbands, to all unsaved people, to all people. We need to be able to speak the truth with boldness. The word faithfulness also means the conviction that God exists and is the creator and ruler of all things. Like I already said, when you wake up every day, do you wake up with that knowledge and that strong belief that he is the ruler and the creator of everything around us? That he's it? He's everything. I hope that you do. Every morning when you wake up, you wake up and say, God, it is so awesome. I serve such an amazing God who's in charge of everything, who rules over all things. I hope that's what you do. 
And then the next is a strong belief that Jesus is the Messiah through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. And not only do we have a place in heaven when we die, but we are in the kingdom of God and we are kingdom people. And we all have a purpose and God has a plan for us. And part of it is submission, not only to our husbands, but to the authorities above, the authorities around us. And so this kind of faithfulness really can only be accomplished through a yielded life, yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. When we allow him daily to teach us all things, that is the only way that we can possibly live and walk through some of these verses that we come to is by allowing the Holy Spirit to change us. And so I want to look at what the Amplified says in, in that verse too. When they observe the pure and modest way in which you conduct yourselves together with your reverence for your husband, you, you are to feel for him all that reverence includes. Listen, to respect, defer to, revere him, to honor, esteem, appreciate, prize, and in the human sense, adore him, that is to admire, praise, be devoted to, deeply love, and enjoy your husband. That's a lot, isn't it? Amen. But not only do our husbands deserve that kind of love and respect and honor, but all people do. Jesus Christ died and rose on the cross the third day for all the people around us, the people you're sitting next to, the people out there, your families, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. And we need to have that same love, honor, and respect for all people. The only way that we can do that is through the power of the Holy Spirit and allowing him to change us. And see, I, I have this thing where I've heard over the years where people would say, well, no one's going to tell me what to wear, and no one's going to tell me what to look at, and no one's going to tell me what to do. That attitude is not very precious in the sight of God. But let me tell you something. When I was putting this message together, he stopped me dead. Turned off every sound, every noise, every thought, and he said, Praise Tabernacle is my church. Praise Tabernacle is my church. And so obviously the building is his and everything in the universe is his, but we are God's people. You are his people. We are all people of the most high God. And he does have a right to tell us what to wear, what to look at, and what to do. Amen. Amen. And so, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through Holy Spirit living, is the way that we accomplish this. The Holy Spirit. We serve the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the three are in the one, the one are in the three. They're all the same. They all work under the same authority. And the Holy Spirit is the one that will teach us all things. And this is what Jesus was talking about in John 14, 16 through 17, when he said, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he dwells in you and will be with you what an amazing amazing God that we serve that he would want his spirit to be in each and every one of us teaching us things and so, again, in verse 26, it says, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So he's our teacher. And when you have, when you read the word of God, the Holy Spirit is the one that will bring it to your remembrance, and he'll teach you things and expound on it, and he'll teach you revelation. Revelation is what we need. 
The revelation tells us where to go, who to talk to, who to pray for, how to pray for somebody, what job to take, what job not to take. The revelation that we need in our daily living, and the Holy Spirit will provide that. So when you feel that thing way down deep in your stomach, it's the unction of the Holy Spirit asking you to get up and move, asking you to go do something. And when we do something for him, there's such a great reward in it, not material reward, just such a blissness because we've helped added something to the kingdom of God. And so the thing is, with submitting not only to our husbands, but to all people, and especially to the authority of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting how he will give us what we need, the power that we need to serve him, but we need to ask him to help us to have a willing heart to serve all people and be in submission. He's the one that provides the power, and if we ask him, he'll help us deliver these other things. And so Jesus said in John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Check. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Okay, so for all the guys who are saying, man, I'm so glad we came to church this Sunday. <laughs> for all the guys who, who are going to go home and say, honey, you said in the same way, in the same way that, that, that you, you do guys submit to the government and your boss, in the same way. <laughs> Well, that's all right, because let's go to verse 7, because Peter says this, you husbands, in the same way. In the same way. Live with your wives in an understanding way, as someone who is weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. I want to just cover really quickly four key words that Peter uses in that verse. The four key words are understanding, weaker, honor, and hindered. So let's start with this word understanding. What is Peter talking about when he says you have to live with your wives in an understanding way? Well, somebody gave this example, which I thought was really good. They asked two questions. One of them was this. How many people own a VCR, a DVR, a TiVo, or some device that can record from the television? Second question. How many of you know how to program it? <laughs> See, because there's a big difference between having something and understanding it. And Peter's saying here, I know you have a wife. That's easy. I want you to understand your wife. That's going to take some sacrifice, some effort on your part, some attention on your part. One, one beautiful definition I found to the word understand. How do you understand a person? It says this, you make what is important to the other person important to you. Well, how do you know what's important to that person if you don't take the time to find out? You have to understand. You have to get to know what makes your wife tick. Peter says that part of understanding is taking into consideration that your wife is, this is a quote, don't be mad at me, someone weaker since she is a woman. Okay, now let's be clear about this. The word that Peter uses there is a very specific word in the Greek language, and it means physical strength, physical weakness. That's all it means. It doesn't mean she's weaker morally. It doesn't mean she's weaker spiritually. It doesn't mean she's weaker mentally. Women can be incredibly strong in every area of life, but in most cases they are physically less able than husbands. That's why I heard a woman one time saying, you really do, it's good to have a husband because they can do two important things. They can lift heavy boxes and, and they can kill spiders. <laughs> So, so even though women can be very, very uh, uh, strong in many areas of lives, Peter's saying this, husbands are called to lighten our wives' burden, not to add to it. 
We're to live with understanding. So what about this concept of honor? Peter says live with her with honor. Well, I, I want to quote from a very well-known theologian this morning to give you an understanding of what, what honor is. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Find out what it means to me. Just a little respect, baby, when I get home. See, it's not just Aretha that want to respect. All women need respect, want respect, and deserve respect. And it's impossible to have an intimate relationship with another human being without there being respect. <laughs> Romans 12.10 says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love and give preference to one another in honor. And here are some scriptures from Proverbs that, to remind us why our wives deserve that honor. Proverbs 31.10, an excellent wife, who can find? For her worth is far above jewels. Proverbs 12.4, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband. Proverbs 18.22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. In Proverbs 19, 14, health, the house and wealth are inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Amen. Now let's look at this last word though. What happens when honor is lacking? What happens when a husband fails to show understanding to his wife? Well, let me tell you this little statement that a man made one time. He said, my wife and I have a great relationship. I mean, after all, she has a master's degree in communication. I have a master's degree in theater. So she communicates to me, and I act like I'm listening. <laughs> well, Peter would say this, that man's prayers are going to be hindered. Because he's not showing honor to his wife and he's not understanding his wife. Peter's laying out a spiritual truth here for husbands, for men. And spiritual truths have consequences if they're not followed. A husband's prayers will be hindered if he isn't treating his wife with understanding and if he hasn't given her the honor that she is due. If a husband treats his wife in the wrong manner, he will simply find himself unable to pray or his prayers will just be empty and they certainly won't be answered. Our spiritual health depends on the way that we treat the women in our lives. Amen. I want to share with you a song here. It's called The Marriage Prayer. It's written from a man's perspective and it kind of sums up what it should look like if we're doing it right. I said till death do us part I want to mean it With all of my heart Help me to love you More than I love her Then I know I can love her more Than anyone else Bring her in your presence today And make her what you want her to be I pray to hear her heart And I pray she'll love you more And I pray Cherish and serve her, and we'll bring you glory today, I pray. Father, I said till death do us part, I want to mean it. With all of my heart, help me to love you. More than I love her, 
then I know I can love her more than anyone else. Lord, help me to love her as you love the church, your bride. Help her to submit to me as I submit to you, my life. I pray to hear her heart, and I pray she'll love you more, and I pray to cherish and serve her, and we'll bring you glory today. So I feel like what the Lord would like to do today is be reminded, come forth, receive what the Holy Spirit has, whether you're married or not married. Being baptized in the Holy Spirit is not a one-time event. We need to be filled over and over and over. And what the Holy Spirit said to me is that we have been sitting comfortably too long to get up out of your seats. Come forward. Say yes to the Holy Spirit that you want to start living for Him. You want to start being taught by Him, not quenching Him anymore. Come up. Come forth now at this moment, and I'm going to pray for you. Pastor Steve's going to pray, and we're going to just give the Holy Spirit time to work. So come up out of your seats and come forward and meet God again today. I felt like the Lord said, um, well, Lee Borden had said, one, that there was a reconciliation back to God that needed to happen. Also, if you're single, you are married to the Lord and I believe the Lord would want to make a connection for you that there would be a married couple that could pray with you and be um, in, account, in, in, in accountability with you as, as unto the Lord, kind of like a covering. And so we want to pray for that. So just... Hi, how are you? Fine, how are you? Do you want some prayer today? Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you, Heavenly Father. So we ask you, just lift up your hands, people. Lift up your hands to God. Say yes to the Holy Spirit. Let him come. Let him come and baptize you, Holy Spirit. We say baptize us again and again and again. Fill us anew. Fill us afresh, Holy Spirit. We want more. Cry out to the Holy Spirit. Tell him how much you love him and how much you want him and how much you need him to be taught new things, fresh things. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and baptize your people. Baptize your people. Break down every wall in the name of Jesus. I break down every wall that would hinder us from going deeper with you, Lord Jesus. And we love you, Lord. So pour out your love. Pour out your love on your people today, Father. Pour it out, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. We just invite you. We invite you to come and be in our midst. Baptize us again and again and again. Baptize us. Yes. We want to feel you, Holy Spirit. We want to feel your wind and your love and the life that you give us. The joy and the energy Holy Spirit, we just cry out to you. We ask you to come. Come. Fill us up. Fill us up. Fill us up. Just tell them how much you want to be filled anew and afresh. A fresh anointing blow. A fresh wind blow in this place, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for marriages. We pray that you would make them stronger and tougher and more pleasing and more loving in your eyes, O oh God. We pray for all the single people, O oh God, that you would raise them up and help them to be comforted and loved, O oh God. Fill their every desire and their need, Lord Jesus. Let this day be a turning point for all of us. Baptize us, baptize us, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit a new and a fresh anointing, a fresh anointing, let it fall. Just let it fall, Holy Spirit. We love you. 
We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died on the cross for each and every one of us. And you rose again on the third day. And that same power that rose you from the grave is in each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, Jesus. We give you all the glory. We give you all the glory. Father, we thank you that in your word, you're telling us very clearly this morning in multiple verses that we're all doing this thing or called to do this thing in the same way. Wives in the same way. Husbands in the same way. Single people in the same way. We're all just being called to follow you in the same way, which is to submit, to die to self, to pick up our cross daily, and to say, what do you want from me, Lord? And by the power of your Holy Spirit, enable me to do that thing that you've called me to do today. I want to be willing. I don't always have the strength, but I know your word says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, Father, we ask you to just help us each day to come to that place of saying, I'm yours. You do have the right to tell me what to do, what to wear, what to look at, what to say, and anything else that's in my power, I yield it to you and say, whatever you want, that's what I will do today. We thank you for it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget about the Atlantic City Rescue Mission children. As long as you're up near the front, the basket's right there. If you need prayer for anything uh, special, healing, or a prophetic word, the team will.